So, Middle East, North Africa revolutions, revolutionary process. I mean, it's been a very exciting movement since the 14th of January, since Ben Ali resignation and departure for Saudi Arabia. Hopefully, Saudi Arabia will welcome many others' dictatorship and do like a compound for all of them. You can have fun over there. And um, waiting for there, of course, to be uh, judged for the all their criminal acts. Um, so, where, where does this uprising, this revolutionary process come from? It's not spontaneous, as we have been hearing in the media, it's not at all. There has been political struggle in the past, in these countries, especially in Tunisia and Egypt, where we're witnessing the most advanced uh, revolutionary uprisings. In Tunisia, we have seen in the past universities being centers of resistance. Uh, this is why unions were very often, the main union uh, student was forbidden in Tunisia because it was very active. Nevertheless, it was very active and resistance against this regime. And we've seen in 2008 in the region of Gvax, it's called, in the mine region, we have seen uprisings, strikes, ongoing in workplaces against uh, corruption, against um, I mean, this regime against for better um, living and working conditions. In Egypt, I mean, the political struggle has been ongoing now for more than 10 years, especially since 2000, since the Second Intifada began. And since then, in Egypt, you had political struggle with Kefaya movement, with different anti-war movement as well, Cairo conferences going on. And as well, you had the biggest social movement since the Second World War in Egypt. The big... I mean, in, I think in 2010, they said there was every day minimum three strikes in Egypt per day. It was amazing. I mean, yeah, 2010. And you had the biggest social movements in Egypt ongoing for more than five years. Strikes, occupation. Uh, I mean, it was really amazing. And the, the, the creation of two, uh, one independent unions. And you had, I think, end of 2009, half a million of tax collectors in the streets of Egypt asking for better uh, working condition and the creation of independent uh, union. So it's like, just like the student union in, the, in Great Britain. You know, you just had people not going on the street, just going on the street because they felt like it, because it was the, the moment to go. You had a lot of people in Great Britain being part of Stop the War movement in 2003. In London, we had two million people in the streets. So you had political education, you had 2006 war in Lebanon, 2009, uh, 2008, 9, uh, Gaza war as well. So you had political education and these students that went in the streets were these same students that were politically educated through these years. So this is what happened in mainly in Egypt and Tunisia and many other countries as well. What we're witnessing today, Bahrain has been moving for many years, we had important uh, um, working uh, workers movement as well in Algeria, uh, and now we're witnessing as well a new united Iraqi national movement, a true national Iraqi national movement from the north of Iraq and Kurdistan, uh, no, the, the north of Iraq, Kurd Iraqi Kurdistan, in Baghdad, and in the south as well, in Basra. This could be the new era of a new national movement in Iraq. This is very interesting, and, um, and seeing that sectarian issues can be over, I mean, overlap and can be not uh, a problem for social and united movement. So, what is very interesting in what we're seeing in the Middle East and North Africa is the anti-systemic characteristic of these uprising. Especially, I will take the two examples of Egypt and Tunisia. And the slogan of the Egyptian is very uh, talkative. Uh, I mean, it's very, um, it, it tells a lot, I think. It's freedom, independence, and social justice. Freedom. They've been reliving on the authoritarian regimes for more than 30 years, being in Egypt, in Tunisia. They want freedom. They want the, the right to express themselves. They want the right to, to gather. They want the, the right to, to create political parties the way they want. This is the first, of course, demand of the people, to be able to decide for their future. And this is so basically the first one, uh, a, a call against authoritarian regime, a call for freedom. This is the first, I think, part of the slogan. And the second one is independence. Because when we, you're seeing uh, people in the streets in Tunis, in Cairo, and elsewhere, even in Libya now, 
They say freedom for Palestine. You can always see Palestinian flags, and you had in Egypt, following the, the, the success of the, the, the downfall of Mubarak, people uh, chanting, we will free Palestine, we will go to Jerusalem. So this is an anti-imperialist characteristic that is very present in the uprisings we're witnessing all over the Arab world, from Bahrain to Iraq as well. Everywhere there's this anti-imperialist characteristic. People are saying we're not anymore going to follow uh, foreign policies that are not our feelings and not in our interest. This is very clear and the Palestinian issue is always back in the, the different demonstrations, you always have chantings of Palestinian flags in the demonstrations. So this is the second characteristic, independence. And finally, social justice. And for me it's a very important characteristic, because these revolutions are following the financial crisis. And Tunisia and Egypt, the way uh, their economy was based, they have been implementing neoliberal policies for more than 30 years. This is a fact. And these neoliberal policies have been catastrophic, for these societies. I mean, in the, these neoliberal policies have impoverished the people at a level we cannot even believe. I mean, nearly half of the uh, population in Egypt was living with, with less than two dollars per day. You had privatization of the state system, the state uh, companies. You have um, education system being also undermined. I mean, in Tunisia as well, the market was based for foreign demand, not for internal demand, for national demands. So, following the, the financial crisis, because of foreign demands, the economy collapsed in many ways in Egypt and uh, Tunisia, because they were based on foreign, uh, as I said, foreign demands. So these new neoliberal policies were catastrophic for this uh, society. And this is why you had social movements so important in these countries, being in Tunisia, in Egypt, uh, and people uprised because I can I guess, again, this neoliberal policy is impoverishing the societies. So, it's completely anti-systemic revolution against autocrat, uh, authoritarian regimes, corrupted regime, uh, the will of the side of their representative, the will of the people to decide for their representative. And it's anti-imperialist revolution as well, uprising, because they want to decide their foreign policy. They want foreign policies in their interest, not in the interest of the imperialist. They want, the issue of Palestine is coming back. They don't want Egypt to be uh, serve as a collaborator in the crimes that are happening in the old Middle East. Being uh, an instrument against Iran as well. This is very important. So, and the third characteristic is these revolutions are against neoliberalism. Against neoliberal policies that has impoverished the people and mainly uh, we're only in the favor of a small minority of comprador bourgeoisie, bourgeoisie serving for an interest and completely impoverishing the society. And they were also uh, made in favor of foreign companies that came in masses to, um, to use, I mean, low added value production, uh, low salaries uh, people. This is what happened. So these are the characteristics of this uprising and this revolution. Uh, now, in Egypt and Tunisia, we've entered the revolution process. With the downfall, with the resignation of Ben Ali on one side and Mubarak on the other side, we've been seeing victories of the revolution process, one after the other. I mean, first government of Tunisia was completely refused the people, the people came back in the street. And Egypt and Tunisia, I mean, this is, I mean, the thing, you know, you have a success in one country, the, the theory of the permanent revolution has a lot to do in here, you have, because the need for the revolution to be successful, you need it to, to spread it. This is, and this is where we entered, you know, the, the revolution process. I mean, the Tunisia people demonstrating to, to gain the democratic, um, uh, the democratic rights, but as well the social rights. And this is also what we're witnessing in Egypt. People are pushing for democratic and social rights. This is why you have important strikes now in Egypt, still ongoing because people want better living conditions, want better working conditions, the fight against corruption, the fight against uh, directors that were corrupted, that used to take the money for them, uh, they want to change up directors. So definitely you have this, both of the, the rights, democratic and social rights are important. And this is how to understand what is happening in Egypt and Tunisia pushing for democratic, but as well for social rights. 
Okay. <laughs> um, and this is why the revolution process is ongoing. This is why people are still in the street for demanding for the um, rights for their rights to be completely protected. And what we're seeing now is counter-revolutionary forces organizing. In Tunisia, we've seen a new political party called El Watan, and where few of the people were members of the Ministry of Interior, saying they're independent. We've seen messages sent to the people saying, be aware of, um, be careful of Islamists and leftists, they want to destroy this country. This is what is happening in Tunisia. Creation of cow also, very important. And in Egypt as well, where we have, we've, seen, we've witnessed what happened yesterday. The army is not ready for total change in Egyptian society because we shouldn't forget that the army is a big economic actor in Egypt and also the milit it's a military regime and the, milit the top commando has been serving foreign interests, especially the US foreign policies they do receive more than $2 billion uh, on a general scale since 30 years. And these counter-revolution counter forces are organizing now. We've seen also, for example, Amal Moussa uh, presenting himself for the candidate, uh, for running for the presidential ele elections. He said, we will still promote a relationship with America. We won't um, put an end to the um, peace agreement with Israel. He's not a threat to the army. He's been in the system for many years. And he's not a threat also for the neoliberal elites in Egypt. These counter-revolutionary forces are therefore organizing and we should, be, be, we should be careful of their forces. And now we'll come to move to the UK imperial policies in the, in the region. We've, we've seen David Cameron going in Egypt, going to the different Middle East countries praising Egypt revolutionaries for going in the streets, whereas when we, the student, went in the street, he sent the cavalry. And after, he didn't, in Kuwait, did a big arm deal, whereas Kuwait was a week ago repressing its own people because they were demanding their rights. So definitely this uh, imperial policies and the will now of the UK to intervene in Libya is hiding, of course, BP and different uh, economic and political interest. Because where were the different humanitarian uh, intervention when Gaza was bombarded, when Lebanon was bombarded in 2006? Where were the USA in Bahrain? They have a, a big base in Bahrain. They can intervene in two minutes if they want. So there's no a so-called uh, desire to, for, for, uh, to, to put an end to the conflict in Libya. There's a, a desire of for foreign intervention, for neo-imperialist policies, for political and economic interests. And in actually what is happening in Egypt and in Tunisia has shown us that the only way to democratize these countries are through popular uprising, popular revolution. Because what happened? Is Iraq a democracy now? One week ago, I think, they did a popular demonstration, 20 persons were killed. This is the democracy that uh, uh, America and the UK has brought to the Middle East. This is not the, the democracy people want. The democracy people want is in Egypt and Tunisia. This is how the revolutionary process, how the, the, the interests of the people will be represented. And this is a clear message to Mr. Bush and Mr. Blair that their actions were completely catastrophic and the only way for democracy again in this region is for people uprising. So, in conclusions, uh, what are the consequences? Yeah. What are the consequences of this revolution, especially in Egypt and Tunisia? Again, and after I would I can come back on different countries if you want in the, the questions uh, um, on a national issue. Definitely, this revolution will have impact. Will be able to put an end to these neoliberal policies that have impoverished the people. But also, how to put an end? For example, we've seen what happened in Egypt. These sectarian issues. This is the rest of authoritarian regime for 40 years. This is the consequences of authoritarian regime in, for 30 years. And of course it will take time to, to fight what happened and everything because the only way to defend the people is through democracy. There is no need of dictatorship, whether being in Egypt, Syria, minorities or whatever, being religious minorities, se uh, sexual oriented, there is no need of dictatorship or so-called secular the, uh, dictatorship to protect 
these people. The only way to protect these people is through democracy. And this is very clear, through a, a state of law, a rule of law. This is the national. So people will be able to decide for their future democracy uh, for their foreign policies. On a regional level, we shouldn't forget that the liberation of every, uh, of every people in this region from an authoritarian regime is a step forward for the liberation of Palestine. And this is clear. Every time a state, an authoritarian regime falls in this region, is a step forward to the, uh, the liberation of Palestine. And internationally, I think we in the UK, in different European countries, in the state, have a lot to learn of what happened in, the, in Egypt, Tunisia, and the whole Middle East. That these people rise against neoliberal policies, against imperialist policies, and we should learn from them. We should learn how to walk like an Egyptian, like a Tunisian, like a Nigerian, and everything else. This is why, on the 26th of March, every one of us should march. Because we're not only uh, sending our solidarity to the people in Britain, saying that we're against the privatization of the whole society of Great Britain, but we're sending solidarity to the Arab Revolution, saying no more imperialist policies from this government. We're saying clearly that we're against neoliberal policies, against the privatization of societies, and for true democracy, for a true big society that represents really the people, and not a so-called uh, big society that only represents one class in the city, this is not us. So this is why we, if you want to support our revolution, m march on the 26th of March. March like an Egyptian, like a Tunisian, like all of them. Thank you very much.